Hello everybody, it's Foxy D again. I'd like to give a shout out to my uh, four subscribers, whomever you are, and to the people who have liked my videos so far. So I do appreciate your support and uh, I'm hoping that I can help you and maybe you can help me. So here we go. This is the third time I record video number five. First two times were a little bit tough. Came across with a lot of bravado. My husband is very helpful. He's a great spouse. I'm really lucky to have him. You have to understand that talking about this stuff, even though it's past, is very difficult. It brings up all kinds of emotions. For myself, like I said, there were some physical, physiological uh, manifestations and uh, negative, yeah, negative physical consequences because of the mopping. And one was just really bad back issues. I used to suffer from back issues, mechanical back issues years ago. And it was like that problem came back with a vengeance. It was really bad. And I'm going through something else. I'm not going to get into too many details, but I'll find out on Friday how serious this other thing is. Hopefully not so much. Uh, but I'm here to just raise awareness or to help raise awareness about what mobbing is and what it can do to people. Now, I told one of my mobbers directly that some people commit suicide from stuff like this. I said, what if this was the only thing I had? Like, I'm lucky. I have a lot of interests and talents and have a beautiful supportive spouse and some very good friends, very close. Um, I am an introvert and an HSP, and that's just who I am, right? Um, so I'm pretty satisfied with my life. And I just wish to God that I had been satisfied with my job, but I wasn't. Like I said, it was a bad fit between who I was and who I am, not who I was, but who I am and the needs of the organization, quite frankly. So I don't really consider myself entirely a victim of this, but more of an observer and somewhat of a participant. So I'm re-recording this video for the third time, trying to do it without so much bravado because I really went off on a bit of a tangent trying to target actually people who mob me, which is useless at this point. Let them live and let live, right? Um, it's not about vengeance. I don't want to make it about vengeance. I could, and I don't want to do that. I want to stay clear of that. I want to stick to the facts. Again, this video is for you and not for me. Maybe one day we can talk about the particulars of all the mobbing incidents and get into more detail. Um, but right now, let's look at what the stages of mobbing are, how it happens. So I'm going to start off by saying, Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Now that's not just in Japan, that happens a lot in North America as well. I don't know if you've noticed, our society has become a lot more rude. I mean, I'm a middle-aged lady, you know, getting way over the hill, but here we go and it's okay. Comfortable with that. The one thing I'm not comfortable with is... You know, I remember how people would talk to me when I was younger. Like, in our day, people would behave this way. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. In my day, we would behave with respect to each other. You wouldn't let a door slam in somebody's face. Uh, you wouldn't treat someone with disrespect overtly. It just wouldn't be the case. And I grew up in a very small Italian-Canadian community. And it's also my culture. My culture, we treat people with respect. And we don't like being disrespectful, but nobody does, okay? Um, but that's basically it. Now, a lot of people misinterpret kindness for weakness. See, it's not weakness. It's respect. To me, it's like I give respect, I expect respect back. But we're living in this very dystopian society. It's very Orwellian, where it's almost like kindness is definitely viewed as weakness. And passion and compassion are as well, which I find really peculiar, but that's just the way it is. So... Be that as it may, workplace mobbing, rudeness, incivility is on the rise, and not just in North America or in richer countries. It's everywhere. I've been corrected, so and I own it, and I don't mind. I'm pretty open-minded. Um, it is what it is. So I've been speaking to people on different platforms about their experiences, trying to gather up as much data as possible to see what we could do about this. All right, again, raising awareness, being there for each other, trying to help each other. So, okay. So, video five, I want to talk about the stages of workplace mobbing, how to handle yourself accordingly, depending on what stage you find yourself in. 
So I'm going to be looking at my notes back and forth. I'm not trying to ignore anybody, but here we go. So uh, as I stated previously, often, at least it was in my case, management is a part of the bullying and mobbing. It doesn't have to be the highest level of management. Sometimes it's middle managers um, looking to advance their own careers. They don't really care about the organization's health or about the employee's health. They care about themselves. So think of it this way. Oftentimes in organizations where management is narcissistic, looking out for their own interests or their own egos, you're going to have a little toxicity in the workplace. And if you have any degree of integrity, it's going to be very difficult okay, to work in that kind of an environment. I digress. Here we go. Five stages of workplace mobbing and bullying. Stage one. You start to notice people are teasing you, you criticizing you, a couple of people. Usually it's like a couple of colleagues that are friends, could be a manager and uh, another employee, but you'll start to notice little digs and comments. Like for me, it was some dude after I'd come back from my vacation, you know, and I tried to help him and he comes back and says, you should be fired, ha ha ha, you know, and so-and-so agrees that you should be fired. It's kind of weird, right? Or it was cold in the office, they had arbitrarily just turned the temperature way down, and uh, one of my fellow colleagues was cold as well. She had a big sweater and a blanket, and I said, it's pretty cold in here. And she starts laughing in my face, saying, ha, 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 you know, look at your face, ha, 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 laughing. Like, it was just weird. So it kind of blew me away. What you do in cases like that, uh, when it's just these isolated incidents, you have one of two choices. One, you ignore it, okay, bad choice. Two, you start to document. You start to document what's going on. This is very important. Why is it important? I'll tell you. Well, first things first, maybe it's just, you know, random incidents. You might want to let it go if it's just random incidents. Maybe it's not random incidents. Maybe it's the beginning of a mobbing. In that case, it's always good to like document these things. So if you can't do it at work, do it when you get home. Okay, just make a note of the time that it happens, who the players are, and what's going on. It's not being paranoid, believe me, because it starts as innocuously as that. So that's number one. So that's stage one. Those kind of things usually start happening, and it's around this time that you can start to put your boundaries up. That's also a very good idea. So putting your boundaries up means... Anything from, you know, a couple of these incidents happen with the same people. You might notice different types of behaviors that maybe are less overt, like covert things, passive aggressive things like eye rolls, uh, people looking up and down, giving you dirty looks. Now, it's hard to confront an eye roll. Um, but if you have everything listed, you can definitely you have to take a step back and breathe. Okay? You don't want to behave out of anger because you're going to dance yourself out of a job believe me, <laughs> okay, or put yourself in a really bad position. So what you want to do is document this stuff, calm yourself down, and plan it out accordingly. And go and see the people and say, I'd like to talk to you, you know, and say, look, I noticed there are a couple of things that you did that I really didn't like, um, and maybe we could talk about it. Most people will happily oblige. You could sit, talk about it, maybe work it out, okay? And But this is only if management is not involved. Because if management is involved, you think you're working it through, you're not working it through. Especially if higher levels of management are involved and they don't like you, it is what it is. But start off with your documentation. Rule number one. Number two, try to do one-on-one -on -one with the offending people. Okay, so then we move on. Like you might get lucky. Maybe that's the end of that. Great, you've just taken care of business. Everything is good, you continue and life is beautiful. Now, if management is involved and they've targeted you, like I said, a mobbing is a planned series of events. It's not random, okay? It's insidious. So say you are being mobbed and say management is involved, you move on to stage two. Stage two is a lot like stage one. With the addition of more people, okay, and the addition of people that used to be your friends will no longer be your friend, Okay? They're going to all start to share information with each other. So this is where the smear campaign and gossip and really bad stuff comes in to make you look like you're a really bad person. 
Now, I happen to be pretty upfront. I give my opinions and I stand by what I say. Um, I've pretty much always been that way, but I'm also a very polite person. I've always been pretty polite at my workplace. What happens uh, typically, though, in stage two is somebody has it out for you. So somebody has a tooth against you for whatever reason, and it's usually not because you're a mean person or a bad person. It's usually because they, they're jealous of you for some reason, okay? So in my case, I think it was just my outspoken nature. Like I said, I had a bit of a cowardly manager. I think he was jealous. So he was a part of it. I also had this female colleague who, and it's crazy because she didn't even do the same type of job I did. Uh, she was paid way more than me, but uh, she was very disrespected or she felt disrespected. She was a mealy mouth type person. She didn't really take a stand. She was all icing and no cake. And I knew she had a lot of problems because she confided in me with all kinds of stuff. She even asked me for very uh, personal type of advice. Um, I'm not going to get into that at this moment in time. But all I could say is that she started spreading rumors about me with people that were at my level, okay? So it's kind of like a smear and hate campaign begins. And what I'm going to say is very Machiavellian. They say something like for every, the way you can get away with a lie is tell nine truths. So what happens is people will pick certain things about you that are true and then they'll inject whatever lie they have to pick, okay? So that's how the smear campaign begins. Now at stage two, you can still try to intervene like you would at stage one, but you're going to have a lot more people to talk to. Typically, what happens at stage two, you can go see management. Again, assuming management is not involved. If you have a good manager on site and you tell them, look, you know, you go there prepared, you go there with your list of events and players involved, and you say, look, some bad stuff is happening to me. I feel I'm being bullied. A good manager will listen, look at the list, and help you through the event. Or at least maybe, you know, you could do some kind of a mediation. You can also do that at stage one, and you could do it at stage two. Ideally, the quicker you catch it, the better it is. Now, if at stage two, I was at stage two when I went to see management. Well, <laughs> my direct manager was absolutely involved. So it was only his pleasure to try to stir the pot more. And his superior, who was kind of like my big boss, just blew me off entirely, okay? Um, and that could happen as well. So anyhow, so that's stage two. What you want to try to do at stage two, if you notice that management is not helping you, it is at that point, okay, that uh, typically you start to get ill. And that's what happened to me with stage two when I started with my back pains, nausea, not sleeping at night, and just that fight or flight response, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so once that begins, it's kind of hard to reel it all in. You go to work, you're tired, you're cranky, you're upset, you feel humiliated, you are full of adrenaline. It's only a matter of time before you pop. And by popping, I mean you tell someone off. And that's exactly the response that they're looking for. See, because stage three is something called the critical incident. The critical incident is what justifies, okay, or appears to justify all of the shitty things they've been saying about you, okay? And it appears to justify all of the lies and the smear campaigns about you. So you're this terrible person. Look how bad she is. Look what she did. Nobody likes to eat the poison that they feed you. My advice to you is by stage two, like just trust that instinct. By stage two, you go talk to management. If you see that they're not playing ball, go see your doctor. Go see your doctor immediately. Um, you know, your doctor, and, I'm, and it's not a fake thing. I'm saying go see your doctor for the adrenaline rush and response, the pains and aches, because guaranteed you will be feeling something whether it be psychological, physical, uh, spiritual, mental, you will be feeling something, all right? So the quicker that you can get out of there and you get like a decent medical bill, a couple of weeks, set yourself and your mind at ease, 
um, if you see that the response from management is negative, my suggestion is take a few days off, just chill, okay, and start to get your CV done up and start to plan your exit out of there. Okay. No matter how long you've been there, no matter how good the benefits are, unless it's like, like I said, this job with a six-figure salary and it's really amazing, I can't speak to that. That wasn't my case, okay? Uh, but you've got to really weigh cost benefits, pros and cons. Is it worth it? Is it worth your health? Is it worth your happiness? To me, no, it's not. The first two times I was mobbed, I didn't follow my own advice that I'm giving you right now. I stayed. I had gotten to stage three. Uh, I was told by one manager that, you know, it was, it was my word against someone else's. Okay? It's a man who literally sexually harassed me, which isn't far. I have some stories, but I'm not going to go there. I, uh, in any case, it was a direct sexual harassment. It was physical, and the guy literally denied it and made me look like you know I was making the whole thing up. It was really nasty. Now, I'm not the me too kind. I wasn't the kind to like, you know, I'm going straight to the union and you did this and you did that. I just figured we could deal with it one on one. But he was trying to save his own reputation, afraid of what I might do. It's just crazy stuff. Anyhow, so stage three, that's my advice to you. Okay. Uh, so once it gets to that, and I know you're going to feel bad because, you know, you th all these people are saying these mean things about you and saying that you're a bad person, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all I could tell you is this. Know who you are. Stay grounded. Love yourself. It doesn't matter what people have to say or think. It matters who you really are. So screw them. Okay? And truth is, they're not very nice people. For the most part, they're really not nice people um, if they're engaged in this kind of behavior. They're narcissistic and shitty. Or, like I said, even though I was the cowardly lion myself, or they're cowards and you don't want to be friends with people that aren't going to have your back. Sorry, it's true, right? So try not to let that get to you and do go seek medical attention, all right? Talk to your doctor, go see counselor, engage in some good therapy. Uh, so that's stage three. The, there's the critical incident and they're going to use it. And that's typically the blow up. For me, it was calling a colleague who was an asshole an asshole. <laughs> and so God knows what spun out of control from there and what else was said. Um, but a lot of stuff. Anyhow, we move on. If you choose to stay after stage three, typically you get to stage four, that's when you get to the mediation. Now, I had asked for mediation with one particular colleague. I'd spoken about him, the guy who wasn't too bright, but who helped me out a lot at the beginning. He, he, he refused to see me. He said that he was too busy. So he refused mediation. And again, with bad management, my the manager I had gone to see with this, who wasn't my direct manager, someone else, you know, well, it's possible that he's too busy. He should never refuse mediation. It's ridiculous, but he refused. And I didn't feel like going through mediation with anybody else. You know why? Because I had been through this before, and I intended to leave this workplace. Anyhow, just wanted to leave it on my terms. Okay? So stage four typically is mediation. The union is involved, and like I'd mentioned prior, in my case, I was actually, one of my mobbers was a union member. So that wouldn't really suit me anyways, okay? These are people with no ethics, so, you know. And again, if management wants you out, they're going to find you, they're, you, they're going to make sure that you find your way out the door, okay? So to me, I wouldn't recommend stage four. Even if you have everything documented well, because if you get to stage four, that typically means, like I said, management didn't do anything to help you. And it's not a good workplace. Because if you had an ethical manager, okay, people would be happier in the workplace, less competitive, less catty, uh, less bitchy, and less toxic masculinity would be happening in the workplace. Okay? Because we have toxic masculinity. We also have this catty, bitchy, I'll call it toxic femininity. I hate even using that word because I, I I, don't like that. It's almost like denigrating men and women. I don't want to denigrate anybody. But if you exaggerate a behavior, okay, like if you're like Mr. Nasty Man, like, you know, 
being really, really mean, or if you're Miss Catty, bitchy woman, you know, being jealous and nasty. You know, that's what I'm talking about when it comes to toxic masculinity and femininity. You do get that behavior. It's horrible. Once the mobbing has begun, it's hard to reel in. So by stage four, like I said, if you get to that stage, chances are it's so hard to undo. I'm sorry about that. It's so hard to undo all of the damage that's been done that stage five typically takes hold. Stage five is they fire you. You're deemed the troublemaker. No matter how well your notes are written, uh, no matter how many pages of notes you have, workplace mobbing is really hard to prove because every incident could be disproven. Be like, oh, that was all coincidental. I was told that by one of the managers at some point because I had said at the beginning that one of the managers was a friend, but he really wasn't. He was feeding all of the information I was telling him to the big new boss. Anyhow, just ridiculous stuff. But anyhow, I hope that's relatively clear. I didn't want to come across too bravado-y, and I hope I didn't. And I wish you all the best, and I'll be back with more videos. Please send your questions, queries, or concerns to foxyd at gmail.com.